Hey, everybody. I'm Jordan Tenenbaum, social media manager at Saligo and host of the Technology Leaders podcast. We are joined, as always, by Mark Simon, my co-host, our vice president of strategy, and our wonderful guest, Tessa Berg, Mod Ops CTO. Tessa, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, I was wondering if we could start out uh, something that we always ask, but tell us, you know, just kind of a little bit about your story and kind of how you got to where you are and your, your journey from vice president of tech to CTO at ModOp. Yeah. So I started my career on in internal IT and as a, a webmaster was the name of the role back in the day. And anytime anything happened with a computer, you know, people just assumed I could fix it. <laughs> but it's, like, it's not that easy. But I really got curious about why we were spending so much time in bug fixes and redoing software at you know one of my first jobs. And so I was low man on the totem pole, really responsible for what was called patch delivery systems and desktop support. But these conversations where marketing would ask for a feature and then development never seemed to get it right. And then we had to go back to testing. I just became like fascinated by that. Like, why, why is this such a problem? And being young and naive, I thought, well, I could probably do a better job explaining these requirements. And so I apply to an advertising agency out of the IT department uh, back in my hometown of Cleveland. And someone took a chance and hired me as an account coordinator. And it was a fascinating two years experience, uh, which is about how long I lasted in a brand agency. <laughs> and I really grew to appreciate um, user data. And so from there, I started, mm -hmm. went back into more of a developer role, but really focused on SEO, was an early user of AdWords. And that was my foray into the marketing tech stack and finding that intersection of what's most important and what I learned from the brand agency is the customer experience first. If you can nail down what motivates people and how to engage them in a valuable way, then the tech underneath is meant to be in service of that. And what I found at the next couple of roles, I, I led marketing, um, I worked mm -hmm. at a couple of software startups and was a product manager um, and for headless uh, systems and platforms without UIs where user intent and how to serve the user is still about experience, but in a much different way and much more your user is different. Um, and then after my last start startup um, sold, there was an opportunity to become a partner at a marketing company. And they were doing a lot of cool stuff in traditional marketing, but they had a client who really wanted to explore that intersection of what tech could do to accelerate their commercial business. And that company was called Tenlo. We were acquired by Mata and moved from the VP to CTO role kind of reluctantly. And this was actually the second time in my career I'd been offered a position as CTO. It wasn't like a path I saw for myself necessarily. <laughs> um, but I think where CTOs play a really important role in marketing today. And even if there are CTOs who aren't at marketing companies, it's extremely important to partner across disciplines and create a, almost a framework for how do we align on our users and metrics of success at the beginning, and then think about what's the data strategy behind that next. I think that marketers have always naturally been data-driven. It's, it's why I'm fascinated and love um, marketing as a practice is because they respect data, but they respect it in forms like reporting and results. And what tech can bring and what people with data science backgrounds and computer science backgrounds can bring is if we understand the end goal first, we can reverse engineer on getting the right data through your experiences and your campaigns to make those reports and results richer. So that's sort of the role I've played um, throughout my career is sitting between those two departments, being that bridge. And then now as the CTO, it's really about looking at how do we lean in to AI and ML in that same spirit? Where is it a tool for us? What is the type of data that we need to produce higher quality, more productive results? And then how do we begin to educate and scale that across the business and for our clients? 
that's that's, and that's great. That's that's really that's really interesting, Tessa. I, and I think a CTO role, it a, a CTO, and, and the way you described it is, you know, it shows the how it presents differently in different types of businesses. And I think that's that's really intriguing. I think it's often hard for people to understand really what a CTO is or what it can be. Because I think there's, because um, as soon as you move out of the realm of say a product company, like a tr you know a full like software company, there's a lot of questions like, oh, what what does a CTO really do? How is it different from a CIO? What's the what's the what's the value of that? Are you keeping? Are you sort of just keeping the lights on and the the trains running on time, or is it transforming the business? And um, and if I heard correctly, what Monop is really taking a different, like they're taking the focus of of using that role, and you're using that role to to transform the business, to be more of a a, a business first and technology second. And, and am I am I kind of understanding that correctly? Yes, yes, I, I would say. You know, it was the other time it was at a, a software startup where I considered mm -hmm. being a CTO. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. It's very different. And that would have been because I was a part of the product development. I knew how this software worked. We took it, we replatformed everything, did a new MVP and, and scaled it. And so it's like, well, you developed it. And so now you're the CTO. Where at ModUp, it's like all of our clients, we are a service consulting company. Mm -hmm. They all have their own tech stacks. We, our job is to say, how are they going to get the most value out of that tech stack to meet this objective? And we're talking to the marketing folks. So they have, I need to get more customers. I need to sell more product, any more leads, any more conversions. It's very different than being, you are the CTO to build confidence that what's in our stack is going to make most use of their stack and empower them to do work on their side in parallel. Like we, we don't lean into hire us, we're going to do everything soup to nuts. We lean into how are we going to architect a platform together that empowers your team and leverages our expertise and how to get and how to meet your marketing goals, get more customers, mm -hmm. increase conversions. Yeah. So it, it is really, it is really um, different. And it's yeah. funny, but the thing that I think is common across both is being able to communicate across disciplines. Like even at the software startup, I feel like what the CEO appreciated is that I could talk to a client and I could talk to the development team. And I feel like there's almost the same now. <laughs> you know, it's like you can talk to the strategists and then make it more accessible for what they're trying to achieve with the tech team uh, and understand the risks. And I think that's something that we bring to you as a company is especially with ai and ml there's always going to be a risk and let let's manage it not shy away or let fear get in the way of using it that's that's really interesting one of my takeaways there is it really sounded like you know it sounds like in at the at modop at, in, an, in an agency role you're really almost acting as as cto modop you're actually acting as a technology advisor really to your clients and you're advising them on their stacks. And do you find that most of the time they have te a technology leader in-house, a clear technology leader, or is it often kind of murky and you're kind of coming in and helping crystallize that vision for them? Yeah, that's a great question. So it varies. I would say what we often find when the decision maker is a VP director of marketing, the marketing mm -hmm. department has um, the ability to purchase tech on their own. And it, mm -hmm. it can, it's not always a part of that company's bigger stack or their CTO's primary concern. Mm -hmm. And a lot of time marketers, when they purchase tech, will be using maybe 10% of the features. Like they don't fully appreciate what it was that they purchased or how to get the most value out of it. Then we find we do larger platform projects. We actually recently acquired um, a company called Deep Prism, and they do they lean even farther into the technical world. On staff now, like I'm the CTO of Mata, but we actually have former CTOs and CIOs on staff for that exact type of consulting reason, who mm -hmm. go in and help build that bridge from the business tech stack, your ERP, your CDP, and into the underutilized marketing tech stack. Um, but I think a key theme is 
regardless of the decision maker, what I see a pattern is underutilization and lack of change management to have effectively rolled out that stack. And then, yes, that is the advisory role we play <laughs> because it, it, it can't be, people often blame the tech. Like, well, we, we bought this and we stood it up. It didn't work. And it's like, well, <laughs> um, you know, there's no magic bullet. It's about what's the program that you're powering with it. And are we getting it? what we can out of this platform uh, to make that happen. Yeah. I, you know what you mentioned something there about that with, with companies, they buy, they buy tech, they implement it, they buy the software and they don't quite get the value. And I, I mean, that I, I laugh there because that, that resonates a lot with me, whether it's from my consulting background or on ERP and digital transformation and e-commerce or now in software, like software, in, in especially around integration and automation, we see this, we see this constantly, and, and that's part of the problem that, uh, you know, feel like it's a Lego we solve. But this is really interesting because this is maybe one of the most universal themes I've seen in business, especially in in mid market and, and really in the whole mid market and getting down at SMB is is so often they buy something. There's massive aspirations like, hey, this is going to solve all of our problems. And it kind of does, but once the smoke and the dust settles after the implementation, it, I mean, very few companies seem to be really getting the value from it. And and what what are you seeing are the keys for somebody, say somebody that's listening, right? A, a, a business leader, a technology leader, and we're almost, I mean, everyone's almost always buying software or evaluating yeah. or and, and, like, what are the, what are the things that you see that set them up for, for success? So they, so they get value so that they go into a purchase and an assessment and an implementation, thinking about right, the right things to actually get that value, um, whether it's something in your marketing stack or re really probably those principles apply anywhere. Yeah. So it's interesting. I've spent as much time in my career on the client side and the business side as I have on the agency side. And I had the same answer for both. Because some people are like, oh, that's because you're at an agency. When I was on the client yeah. side, they were like, oh, no, well, that's because, you know, we're on the client side. It's like, no, you have to have someone who owns the platform, who owns your tech stack. So if you buy software, you are finding a person internally. So if I am a brand and a business, I'm buying software, I have someone who owns what that software is. So that if you have a consultant come in, let's say it's us, we are helping you create a plan. We have a person who's going to help with the training, change management, and measurement. And I think the key to success mm -hmm. is that there's an owner and they subscribe to those three things as part of any implementation process. And there are always reasons to skip it. There are always reasons to say like, <laughs> well, we don't really have anyone right now. Okay, the consultant company can put an embedded employee. I've been personally been an embedded employee two or three times. Mm -hmm. Like I, I like that model, but someone still has to carry it on and own it. And it has to be married to that training, change management and measurement. Um, so I, I think those, I would say those words a lot <laughs> in any project, but like, if you're not doing that, then it's not, the product won't stick. The process won't stick. Tech serves people in process. So you need people in process. Uh, I mean, that, that's that's absolutely fa I mean, fantastic answer because I, I couldn't possibly agree with that more. <laughs> um, in my my same experience across hundreds of clients, I saw the same thing over and over again. And I think what you're talking about is maybe what I see is the absolute number one reason that I've seen ERP projects fail. I've seen e-commerce implementations fit fail. I've seen digital marketing initiatives fail. Um, or often they 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 work. They work when when they're when they go live and they're released, but the they they fail to meet business initiatives, the business's goals long term, or they even fail before they and and some of them fail before they get launched. And when they do, it, it, every single time. I've seen it come down to a, a lack of own, like a lack of an owner, um, yeah. whether it's someone that that has owned it explicitly, but they didn't have the they didn't have the bandwidth or the right experience to devote to it, or it didn't really have an have an owner and and, and a consulting a consulting firm and a third party can take ownership for a while, but unless there's an explicit designation of ownership to a third party and say, okay, you're going to be our fractional 
CIO to own this system, or you're going to be the fractional um, uh, tech tech stack owner in the marketing department. And it's clear, it's crystal clear who that is, and it's a third party, which it very rarely is. It, it, uh, it like I, I, I mean, it, I've just seen that over. I mean, dozens and dozens of times where things have have kind of they start to get rough, and it's like, oh, who's the owner? You look around, and nobody is. And mm -hmm. and I, I don't, I just that's so critical. I think for companies, um, especially when they take on something new, right? They're evolving. They're going to the next step, and you're going to the next step. You're you're doing something new, and unless the team's been through this before, they've been through an implementation of a particular type of marketing software or um, a new CRM or a newer ERP. Or, they they won't necessarily be like they, they won't connect that, and sometimes they'll dismiss it when when I ask. So I'm really curious. How you, how you have that conversation, the the right conversation, because I, I've they can be often quite challenging with clients around that. But how do you have that conversation successfully, and and what are the the techniques you've? Because I've seen this done really well, and I've seen it done not not work not so well. So maybe yeah. maybe I can learn something from you today. I'm oh hoping. man, I don't know. Well. Maybe at Sligo, you don't have the type of sales teams that I've worked with. So you know, maybe you don't have this problem, but <laughs> there are I'm, some, you know, there are some yeah. universal things about sales teams. And I, and I can say, I spent a lot of time working with our sales and I'll roll up and, and I will, I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself a salesperson, but certainly have been there very embedded. Uh, so I, I think there's just some universe that, you know, universal truths kind of hold, hold across uh, companies when it comes to sales. So <laughs> Yeah. And I think, you know, that's where it starts is it ha from the top down, everybody has to understand what the position is in the market and what are some key differentiators that we're hanging our hat on and how do we live them and show it. And that means we are not a silver bullet. That means that the platform can't do any everything and anything you ever dreamed and wanted it to. Uh, and that right out the gate, we are talking about how important it is to go through an onboarding process. And again, like my husband is in um, technology sales. And so I sit across the hall from him. So I, I hear him on the phone and you know, sometimes I'm like, you know, did you tell him about the onboarding process? Like making sure that they're having this owner. But I think when it goes really successful is, um, uh, that balance. You never want to say something to to quash the sale. And a lot of times clients are reaching out because they don't have enough resources. Sometimes the problem that you're solving for them is yes, part of what your platform does, but also like they don't have the budget, they don't have the resources, there's other things missing in and around it. And it's hearing what they have to say, but knowing that what they say and what they do will be different. And find out where your software solves what part of the problem and where you can help them explore the core root of the other problem that they're talking about and not take all the feedback as a next step. So that's something I try and be involved in the, you know, so I'm, I'm speaking a lot from when I was at startups, but this is also still true in marketing. You know, people are people. So all of us as people will say something and we're, we're saying a solution. We're saying the thing we need want, but what we've jumped to the solution and maybe we too haven't spent enough time really saying like, what's the core issue? So if you can uncover that core issue with your client really early in the process, then you can align, do they need extra resources? Do we need to start smaller here? How do we customize our onboarding process to make sure we take this into account? Doing a little more of asking the why behind things. Um, yeah, Dig, digging, digging in, digging in further. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And that's, um, you know, th that's something we've done a lot with actually our sales team. And I've done this in the past at other organizations is really trying to trying to drive, drive them to, go, to just understand the customer better, like understand your customer. Mm -hmm. What? Okay. They, they, someone will show up and say, Hey, I want to buy X or I want you to in consulting. Hey, can you build this for me? And, and they, um, and, and, you know, to use a, an apples and oranges analogy, they'll show up and say, Hey, I want you to build me an orange or I want to buy, you have an orange. I want to buy your orange. But unless you ask the why, why do you want to buy that? Mm -hmm. 
what are your, oh, okay, well, wh why do you want to do that? And ultimately, you kind of get to these high level business goals, you kind of peel back the layers a little bit. I think what's what I found over and over again, is you often realize that they they're asking for an orange or you've or sometimes you jump to a conclusion saying oh the solution to this is is an orange but they really need an apple they just it may have never seen an apple before right. it's right it, they need right. something else similar but different and so if they presented it's presented and if you and if you just jump too far ahead. You jump, you have, okay, we got a solution. Everybody gets excited because you can say, oh, we can do that. We built these before. We've done that. Our product does that. Um, and, and sometimes I've seen the, the best things you can do is, is really just slow down that, that sales process. Um, like you end up, you end up slowing it down, but you create a relation, you end up with a relationship, you create the relationship, you, you kind of shift that relationship, you become an advisor instead of, uh, an organization is, is advising instead of selling now. And, and it becomes really, truly consultative. And I think that's, I think that gets missed a lot, especially in SaaS sales, because the solutions tend to be so precise. There's so many SaaS companies out there that sell something that's in this very narrow lane. And there's more and more of these things in this narrow lane. And and selling something that does a solves a precise business, and I see this in like I always use this as an example in like marketing apps. They have these very very precise things. There's what ten, you know, the uh, the Martech stat. It was like ten thousand oh, yeah. SaaS apps or something. I mean, it's, I, last time I saw that 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 diagram, it just it's, it blows your mind. You're like, wow, that's just in marketing, right? So there's all these really precise things, and that's fantastic. But what I what I get the sense of very a lot of time a lot of the time and back to what you're talking about implementation and adoption I just see those over and over again not being adopted or plugged into the rest of the business you know sometimes you know not just not very well but not at all and, yeah. and I think that's that's the biggest barrier to getting getting the value out of that is okay do you understand do you understand the customer are they making sure they're buying it the right thing and then is it really fitting into their business and are you helping to fit it in and that's I think that's kind of like the big, I see there's a big, big next step for a lot of companies in, in getting, you know, changing how tools and solutions are really being used um, these days. Um, yeah. And the retention will go up the better they understand how it fits in their overall business. Then, then you get to that measurement piece. Yeah. You don't have to, if like a lot of software companies, but we, we do see this a lot in um, marketing. And it's funny you bring up the MarTech stack. Uh, when I was at American Greetings, I worked with Scott Brinker, who is the founder of ChiefMarTech.com. And uh, he, at the time, had a startup called Ion Interactive. And we licensed one of, we licensed that technology for our rapid testing on our landing pages. Yeah. And then we connected it to another platform, which then measured the attribution. Because what was, what we saw happening is because everybody was given the same objective, sales. Everyone has to convert more customers. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're getting into a ton of double counting. We have lost our like need, want, motivation to segment at the top of the funnel because nobody gives a crud about the top of the funnel right now. Yes. It's just about conversion. Yep. And you have to under, even though we had, at that time we strung like three different platforms together, but underneath the journey so that we could attribute back like, how are we inspiring them at the mm. beginning and not, and I didn't even manage those channels, but they had to be measured. Scott's tech did sit at the end, but we had to know how it was impacting everything to get the most use out of it or else what would the value of testing be? You know, so it, I think it is so important, no matter where your niche is, is exactly what you said, Mark, understand where you sit in the organization and and how you're going to measure that value, um, that way you don't get taken out. Because <laughs> then if you're too <laughs> niche and you're like, you know, I'm not even sure this made that big of a deal, you know, and, or, you know, marketers love to test. You got to make it through that pilot testing phase. And the only way you do that is being critical to an overall business vision. Exactly. I, I think, I think that makes, that makes a, 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 an incredible amount of, um, amount of sense there. Um, uh, Tessa, if you don't mind, I might, we might switch gears a little bit and, um, you know, something that, that I've, I've, I noticed and that there's been a topic that's come up a lot lately uh, on the podcast is, is AI. And I saw recently that you've been, you've been talking about it quite a bit, uh, in, in your own podcast. 
and I'm curious, um, you know, how how some of the moves that that Modop is is made recently, how how that's been been impacted by you know the the recent generative AI trends and and what's happening there in that in in the space at large. Yeah, really, really quick, Tessa, just to give the listeners a little more context, and I want to give you an opportunity to ask this. Um, Modop recently purchased. Uh, or I guess acquired DPRISM, which is uh, a company that deals heavily with AI. And also I know Tessa, a little birdie told me that you guys are kicking off your 90 day goals for your AI console, um, kind of moving from testing into scale. Um, and so hopefully that kind of gives people just like a taste, but I'll let you take it away. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure our listeners were were aware of the um, the investments and uh, importance of AI to, to you and Mata. Yeah, no, thank you, Jordan. Um, when we were looking at the DPRISM acquisition and specifically the work that they were doing in AI ML readiness, like helping clients, again, get more out of that tech stack and bringing executive level leadership into what does that look like for clients to have a data strategy, have that data strategy power owned and licensed AI and ML apps to shift roles from more tedious, mundane work commoditized deliverables to strategic. And we're doing that with clients. And that is what we see in the market, that these roles are going to shift from commoditized into being more strategic. And we're doing that internally for ourselves. So we stood up the AI council to make sure that as we were all testing these apps, building out what was going to be our AI core tech stack, that we were doing so in a responsible way that protected our data and our clients' data while measuring what were the lifts in productivity and efficiency that we were experiencing and where were we reinvesting that time to increase value. So it's it has been incredible. Like in the first 90 days, really quick, I would say the best thing is not just testing the tech and seeing the results. It has been collaborating with so many different kinds of people from across all of our offices. So in, we just re- acquired a creative agency, which seems counterintuitive since we stood up the AI ML tech stack to automate a lot of the creative process. <laughs> so what we found is what Gen AI really demands and what some of the AI ML powered media platforms um, that were that were kind of tuning right now really demand is better creative. It it demands more creative strategic thinking in order to tune that model to perform better and better. If you, and I'm sure anyone who's tested has seen, you hit that plateau real early. And if you don't have people who know how to analyze that data and think creatively about what happens next, and if you don't have great creative, then you're not going to be able to scale the results that Gen AI can get. I, I think that that's a fantastic point. And, and I've seen this come up in various places where you know, people are like, oh, well, we'll just we'll just use generative AI to create all that content. Mm-hmm. And I and in 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 and it's it, it's been interesting because I you know I have this recoil reaction. I was like, sure, you can use it to help you edit, help you develop content, but it's not going to generate unique ideas for you. It's actually not going to generate. Cre- it's not true creative thought. And so if you're if you want sort of also ran content. No, you don't. You may not need creative, but also ran content doesn't really move the needle from a from a marketing or thought leadership standpoint. You still have to have original ideas, ideas that are unique, that are think, synthesized, synth, uh, you know, taking you know this this you know multiple concepts together and bringing them and um, synthesizing new ideas from the other ones that are out there, and that's that requires creative people that requires creative thinking. You're not going to get that Uh, generative AI. And from what I've seen repeatedly, it's not going to give you that. Um, It'll help the process. It'll move it faster. It'll take a lot of the labor out of it. The sort of grunt work, but it, 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 what I found is it focuses so that you, it almost like, because you know, you can do more, you need great thinking, creative thinking, strategic thinking, even more. It's, it's even more important. Um, because it, it just puts a focus on that because if you don't it, it all it's just it just generates stuff and that's doesn't you know it doesn't create the high quality that you really need to differentiate um, yeah 
I agree. Some of my favorite use cases have come from the creative department themselves. And now when they're concepting and coming up with these campaign plans is literally asking chat GPT for different perspectives, saying, putting themselves in the competitor's shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can prompt it to take all these different viewpoints to push the creative farther or yeah. version it out. Give a few more different versions. Now, granted, you don't want to get into the give your client way too many choices and then you have paralysis problem. But it, what I, I love that it has pushed creativity, that it's pushing quality, because I feel like, Mark, what you were saying is so true. If you're just doing the Me Too content, it reminds me a lot of like when Meta first came out with the forms inside of social media. I remember looking at some of those first campaign results coming in and you're just, you're getting a lot of form fills and it's all crap. It's like, if you, if you just, if your goal is just get form fills, then yeah, great. Put that there, put, put a contest, have everyone sign up. None of those people are your customers, but if you want to get more customers, then pair your data with a generative AI application and really center it on the data that you're getting to your CDP. What is going to respond most? How am I going to get the highest quality? Because it's not about the quantity. It's about using Gen AI to get the highest quality inside of your campaign. And it, it does require more versions. And generative AI can handle editing, versioning faster because you're tuning a machine. I, and I think you hit on something. You hit on a lot of great points, but the last one there is that it's really it's a it's an accelerator for what people are doing, but it's not replacing it. It's it's right. a it's like a you know. And there's these co-pilot words being thrown out a lot in, in AI, and I I think it's a pretty good a pretty good analogy because it's not replacing someone. It's mere, it's it's sort of putting on a on a on a, a superhero suit, if you will. It's like, it's enhancing people's capabilities. And I think that's where the potential is. Um, I'd love to go back a little bit. When you, we first started talking about the AI, you mentioned something at the beginning that I, 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 is, I think is super important and is coming up. I'm finding it coming up in a lot of conversations with, with customers and partners right now. And, and you mentioned the concept of AI and ML readiness. Mm -hmm. Because I see a lot of business leaders out there, a lot of technology leaders, particularly technology leaders are in organizations that particularly if they're not, the company doesn't necessarily lead with tech. They may be, it's not a competitive differentiator for them already. So, but now what we, what I'm seeing is a lot of tech leaders under pressure from their CEO, from the board, from the whole organization, let alone, you know, I, I mean, my 97 year old grandmother's asked me about uh, AI. So, you know, like everybody's like, oh, are you using that? And, and I see these tech leaders being under this pressure, like, hey, how are we using it? What are we going to do? And yet fundamentally, the business probably isn't ready. And I, I'm curious what you're seeing and, and you kind of hit on it already, but I don't want to go into that a little more. What what are the, the foundational things that you think a company needs to do to really be ready to take advantage of it? Yeah. So one thing that is a universal truth is that it has to come from the top down. The CEO can't say the CTO is going to figure it out or the tech team's got that or we have a CIO or didn't do something with data. It has to be specific to what does differentiate that business. I think that some CEOs jump to, we're going to create our own blah, where, you know, we're going to do this moonshot project. Some are like, well, we already got a bunch of data. And so we're going to start with the bunch of data, but where you have to start and what um, the MADA consulting practice does is at the top. What is our core objective metrics of success? Or what is our big challenge? And you got to do that gap to where it is going to differentiate your business because that is what AI and ML has the power to do. Mm -hmm. But the big step that I see a lot of people skip is first baselining where you're at from a data infrastructure, um, what yeah. tech you already have in your stack. There, and, it, and it's fine. And it's on one hand, it's great that so many people jumped in and started testing. On the other side, again, like you have to say, all right, what's in our what's in our tech stack? Not all data is created equal. Not all data is valuable. And some data that's the least valuable is actually just names and email addresses. So, you know, depending on what you want to do, like, what do you actually know about your customer? If you don't know that, what do you have to start 
engage, you have to engage with them differently in order to have a truly strong data strategy that will differentiate your AI and ML uh, within your business. But I think that when you do a readiness assessment, it sets you up to start and end in a way that you can measure more productively. Like when you don't start with those clean lanes of why are we doing this? Back to what you were saying, why are we doing this? And it comes down from the top and it's paired with training, management, and measurement. Um, then, then I, then what happens is people just keep testing. And I, I hear that a lot as like, well, I don't think we're, we're going to keep testing. You don't have to keep testing. Like if you have not yet landed on a data strategy, not to say that people are behind, but the data you have and how you understand your customers is, is the currency to success for AI and ML. So that's what the readiness is all about. It's like, let, let's start on something that is sustainable and that no matter what apps you have or what you build, you are going to have an asset that is going to continue to help grow your business. Yeah, I, I think that is such a key thing that that data strategy having good pro like the is the foundation of is I mean the the foundation of AI ultimately is data. Uh, you, if you don't have good data, you're not going to have good output. And so when you're as soon as you go beyond some some what I always think of those so, sort of some of those sort of base accelerator. Uh, you know, or research activity, some of those sort of like, but when you really want to do, okay, I want to, if you say, I want to apply AI to the business and do something substantial and generate insights about my customer or, you know, net, really accelerators to, uh, that'll be a competitive differentiator, it all comes down to good data. And that, that I, I've seen that it really repeatedly be the, the big thing holding back so many, of the, so many organizations that do want to do something. And and it really holds. I mean, and these are things that the, really the companies held back already, right? It's it's not just because they want to use AI. It, it maybe puts it to a point to the latest thing, but getting that that good state data strategy and really most often there's a there's a business process problem underneath. There yeah. the processes themselves, the systems underlying that aren't aren't in a good shape. But I know that this often turns into like a very daunting project. Um, that's, do you believe that somebody, in order to go forward with this, does somebody have to boil, like proverbially boil the ocean or can they start small or start in an area of the business and, and build momentum? What are your thoughts on that? No, yeah. So it it varies. My, what I've seen work best and what we've seen work best at Monop is to start you know, with a pilot, with a, sex, uh, yeah. a specific use case and prove out value. Um. We have had a couple of clients come to us and say, no, we're going to boil the ocean and, and say those words or say, you know, we're doing a blue ocean strategy. Uh, that is fine. But everything I say fine reluctantly only because like, even in that, you must pick a lane to start. And so you can yeah. see success early or else it will get killed. <laughs> you, know? so, yeah. you must pick an ocean. Yeah. Yes, you must pick which ocean you're boiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to pick a pond or you, you pick an area to start. I, mm -hmm. And I can't, it's funny. I can't agree with you more there. I think that's, that's so correct. Um, and, you know, always like if you can find somewhere small to start any of these automation data oriented initiatives, uh, AI, they all they often kind of crumble under their own weight if you may try to make it too big. There's too many hurdles. You start some, and the companies that I've seen successful over and over again often start with very few resources, but they start small and they build, and then it, it's kind of like this. It's it's uh just gets this momentum over time because other parts of the organization then want to be part of it. They and and so it it, it grows. It almost like and and sometimes sometimes it's a very grassroots initiative until it gets some some visibility in the in the executive team, and then and then they get behind it. And now you've got you've got something, but that, that start small, I I've seen that over and over again, be dramatically more effective. Um, because people are, people need to see results, right? Yeah. And I would say too, sitting in the, when I've sat on the tech side and in the data teams, I always appreciated when software companies would make their tool available to us, you know, in a sandbox environment to test with and play so that we could sort mm -hmm. of mark it up. I don't know, does Saligo yeah do that as part of its strategy? Do you try and engage the users directly to help sell up? So we have, we have like, uh, we have a, 
uh, basically free tr free trials of a, of the product that we offer, so users can get in, use that. And we've also done things too where we've um, offered for certain customers. Uh, we see that they like build a really strong team, and one of the things that's been helpful there is to, to give them an offer. We're like, hey, we will just give you unlimited usage for a period of time. Kind of like Polag say, hey, what what happens if we sort of take the gates off and let you do whatever you want and then come back and then work in, in a quarter or two quarters, come back and then then true up because then they it, it, it opens it up and lets them experiment without having a, an initial cost hit, do something and then they see value from it. And and then and then they're willing to to make that purchase, but they wouldn't it might not have been they might not have been able or willing to make that justification internally initially. And so that, that concept of kind of letting, letting users experiment, do things and, and then get, get value from it and then charge them once they've gotten value. It's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a shift from some concepts we've seen, you've seen that work in some cases and, you know, it's nothing we've done across the board yet, but it's, when you look at it, we're like, Oh, there's a lot of potential there, especially as we get, companies with larger team like can they create larger teams of builders um yeah. and i think there's a lot there's a there's a lot of potential with that type of uh strategy yeah i i personally love that strategy one thing that i have seen is whenever my per, myself or our developers are experimenting with something free we immediately have to pull in who's ever closest to generating the money on the business case like i always say like okay so we, we see some value. You've done some interesting things with this data. I like these insights, but what does the customer want? How are we tying it there? And something that data scientists understand is feature selection. Like if we have all of this data, not all of it is going to be valuable for the thing that's going to differentiate us or make money. And so whenever... Like we, like in the AI council, we have cross disciplines. If someone is testing, we try and pair them with someone else from a different discipline so we can start to connect those dots. But mm -hmm. also on the client side, sometimes these silos are so big and the walls are too high. But if I'm sitting and I'm a data engineer, how often have I understood what the marketing department is doing and what they're trying to accomplish in increasing sales, increasing conversion and leads? And is, have I oriented the features I've selected to answering that question. Um, but I think there that it only works when you can help the client or when the people inside the client business are able to work across silos and have cross disciplines mm -hmm. hold yeah. value toward toward revenue. Because otherwise, I mean I have developers who do this, you know, you get <laughs> stuck in like testing and like this is cool. I'm like, this does nothing for our business. <laughs> like, yeah. It is cool. You invented something. You might, you know, maybe you sell that on the side. I don't know, but <laughs> but does it? But does it add value? And, right. and this and this and this gets into maybe a, a, a kind of segues into the, the last question. I, I maybe want to squeeze in before Jordan gets to ask his last question, which isn't necessarily technology related. And and that's like I, as CTO, I, I, and and having been in that role before. I can relate. You're at the you're personally at the crossroads between business and technology. And how do you bridge? How do you personally bridge that gap or recommend how, how do you what recommendations you make to other people that want to be that person that bridges bridges that gap from business leaders to technology and engineering? Man, no one has. Uh, I, I I don't know if I'm making this role look too hard, but a lot of people have not asked me how to get up to CTO. <laughs> I think that when I'm coaching some of our younger uh, tech leads up, we always start, I want to make sure they have some financial aptitude and that they're able to pull up and out and see the bigger picture. And that is, that is a discipline that takes some practice. So when there are you know, as um, on development teams, we hear a lot of feedback. It is okay to fail. We test a lot. These things work. These things don't. But we also really appreciate when I get this input, I know this output's coming out. And that is not the case the farther up you move when you lead. Mm -hmm. It is you have to understand that perception is a very big deal, sometimes more important than the actual output. And that no matter how awesome your product or tech is, Unless people 
place a high amount of value on it and they can experience the value, then you really haven't built anything. And that is like, it is a very big leap for younger developers, especially to yeah. get on that journey. And so, you know, it's really sitting back under having some of that financial acumen so that you can understand the consequence of spending too long, over-featuring, testing too much. You, you have to be able to see when are those moments that I need to pull in someone from a, a different discipline to give me feedback, when I need to move to prototype and put that prototype into market to gather more data, um, when I need to collaborate with product. Like I see the path to becoming a CTO is you have to start showing early in your career that you are a bridge builder and that you know the moments to go over across that bridge to keep a project, to keep really anything, a data strategy moving forward. That's great advice. I, I would definitely agree with that. And yeah, with me that, too, totally. <laughs> <laughs> and um, with that, to you, Jordan. Well, thank you. Um, Tessa, just before I jump into this final question, I know we're close to time. Um, I just want to say, one, you've been a fantastic guest. Um, mm -hmm and just been an incredible speaker. So thank you for being a guest uh, on the Technology Leaders Podcast. Um, the way that I like to close these is we got into the weeds. We were talking about some pretty uh, intense and technical things, but I want to remind the listeners out there um, that Tessa is a real person and she has a life outside of work. Um, so Tessa, if you could tell the listeners, what are your passions, hobbies, and interests? What do you care about uh, outside of work? Yeah, I am a deeply passionate person that hasn't come through. I uh, deeply passionate about the English Premier League. I still play soccer, lifelong soccer fanatic. Arsenal is my club. Um, and then also about uh, immersion learning and language, using language as a tool to build empathy and connection with other people. I sit on the board of my kids' school, which is a Spanish and Mandarin language school. And I love the freedom language gives us to travel and really experience um, different countries in a way that is not possible if you don't speak the language. So those are my love traveling, love eating. Um, food goes along with language. So, <laughs> Well, you said traveling and eating. And as I always like to say, don't threaten me with a good time. Uh, <laughs> two of my favorites. Um, stick around for a second, Tessa. But to our listeners out there, thank you for joining us on this episode, episode 21 of the Technology Leaders Podcast. Uh, we'll see you in about two weeks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.